Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I am so sorry to be tardy to the party. Um, we've had two um, uh, emergencies in our building uh, today. So we've had two fire alarms uh, this morning and uh, just had our last one about five, 10 minutes ago. So um, thank you for your patience as we were uh, sitting, waiting outside, frustrating frustrating, yeah, words on a Tuesday, very frustrated about what was going on. So welcome to uh, Lunch and Learn today. Um, I am Kaya Hudgens-Smith. I was hired as a diversity-focused clinical counselor here at ETSU in the counseling centers where I work, um, third floor of the CULP, tucked in a corner if you're ever looking for me, here I am. Um, the reason um, that I was hired, and I really feel like my purpose and my passion is really focusing on um, our historically underserved um, populations here on ETH, ETSU's campus and in the community at large, um, being that of BIPOC and um, queer communities. So I've given this presentation before. There's a little, there's a few changes that I've made to it. Um, but really what we're today we're going to focus on is intersectionality. So recognizing the different identities that we bring to the table um, that either carry a an air of privilege or oppression, and sometimes we have combinations of the both. Um, I am going to bring in some things um, uh, that you may have heard before, some of the stuff, like I said, maybe brand new. Um, so if it's a refresher for you, awesome. If this is a new first time you're ever heard it, Y'all, I'm having troubles today speaking. First time you're hearing this information, um, we just want to, you know, I just want to say thank you for one, uh, being open to spending an hour of your day with me um, to uh, learn some about intersectionality, some of the basics, and some of how you can um, really just improve your own knowledge to hold space for different um, individuals that you might encounter either in your job, um, in your classrooms, or just overall any interactions you might have in life in general. So with that being said, hopefully um, my presentation doesn't go overly long. <laughs> we can definitely have some time for um, some Q&A toward the end or just some general discussion, which I absolutely enjoy very much. So with that being said, let's get into it. So make sure, like I said, we have time to to talk and whatnot. All right, let's see, here we go. I don't think I have any sound, but let's see if we can do that. Cool, cool, cool. All right, hopefully everybody can see my screen. So I have entitled um, this presentation, um, Intersectionality, the many layers of you and me. Um, the reason I even entitled uh, this presentation this way is one, first a reminder that we are not just one identity. Um, I feel like there's many things on the surface that we notice immediately. Um, my immediate identities is, is really my gender and that of my race. So I am Black and I am a, I identify as a woman. Um, however, some of the intersections that you might not see is I have a disability, I am diabetic, and I'm uh, my sexual orientation, which is that I am queer. A lot of people don't see that right off the top. It's a layer of me that I have to reveal. It's also, um, there are also layers of me that do carry um, quite a bit of oppression. Um, and then some privilege because I am educated as well. And I believe that education is, is definitely, I feel like it, it, it needs to be a right. However, it is definitely a privilege to have um, three degrees and um, do the work. So um, a little bit more about me. Um, this is my first full year. I'm not even been at ETSU for a full year yet. Um, I was hired back in September and uh, it has been a ride ever since being hired. Um, my foundation in um, therapy as a clinician started um, in private practice at the Journey Center for Healing Arts. I worked there for five years in private practice. The specialties that I actually honed there and really focused on was uh, gender affirming care, 
because many of the client population that I served were trans adults and adolescents. I also um, really educated myself on racial trauma and also religious trauma. So let's get into it. So what are we going to focus on today? Um, the focus, of course, is what is intersectionality? What is this word, which is actually steeped in critical race theory? How does intersectionality affect me and those around me? And then that last thing we're going to explore is how I can employ cultural humility, which is very different to me than cultural competence. And we'll get into that um, towards the end of the presentation. So what is intersectionality? Um, intersectionality is a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw back in 1989. She was a law student and came across a case where a Black woman was disgruntled because she felt that she was discriminated against because she was not hired at the factory that she applied for, and she felt that was because she was a Black woman. This case, unfortunately, was thrown out because the person, uh, the manager at this plant, they did have um, Black men that worked there, and they also had women. But there was no intersection that really accounted for Black women. And so Kimberly, at that point, started to really research and really dove deep into if we cannot see a problem, then we can't name it, then we can't work on it. So intersectionality is a combination as opposed to the addition of race and gender that creates a specific form of oppression. So saying that we experience life, discrimination and benefits based on these different identities that we carry is very important, not only as how we interact with people through life, but also how we interact with people at our day-to-day -day jobs. Like I said, if you are a, a faculty member, if you're a professor and how you interact with your students. Um, in 2015, this term was officially adopted by the Oxford Dictionary, and they say it's an interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, gender, sexual orientation, applied to a given individual or group regarded as created, overlapping, and interdependent systems of dis discrimination or disadvantage. So we really want to make sure that we're not noticing just what's on the surface, but be intentional about trying to find out more, more than what we just see with our naked eyes. So let's talk about privilege and oppression. If anything you take away from this presentation today is to remember that privilege is unearned access to resources. It's unearned. You didn't have to work for it. It was given. It would just is. Um, and it's only readily available to some people as a result of their advantaged social group membership. That being usually class, um, race tends to be more often than not white, heterosexual, um, able-bodied, religious, and citizens of our country. Oppression is a system, okay? Privilege is unearned access oppression works in systems that maintain advantages and disadvantages based on social group memberships and operates intentionally and unintentionally on individual, institutional, and cultural levels. If anything, we have seen, I would say since 2020, but really I would say even over this past 10, 15 years is how systems of oppression have worked at, you know, worked for some people and not worked for others. So, and when I say that in the sense of power shifts that have happened in our society. So with progress tends to come pushback when, if you really consider this from a historical context, if we really think about it, through history, when there have been when there has been significant progress in one area, we've received pushback in another. As gender affirming care became more and more available to different people, and more people felt more confident to, of course, access 
you know, gender affirming care. Now we have all this anti-trans legislation coming back. Why? Because there was progress in the system that was created to keep certain groups such as trans people, LGBTQI plus queer people, black people, or BIPOC community oppressed. So some of the ways that we see oppression take place can be on individual, which is usually our own attitudes and actions that reflect prejudice against a social group. That can be implicit or explicit or unintentional and intentional, um, institutionalized. So our policies, laws, rules, norms, and customs enacted by organizations and social institutions that disadvantage some normal, some social groups and advantage other social groups. So again, intentional and unintentional. Um, And the other system that we see this in are within our norms, right? So our societal and cultural levels, which are social norms, roles, rituals, language, music, and art um, that reflect and reinforce the belief that one social group is superior to another. And again, this can be intentional and unintentional. And the reason I wanted to also make sure that I kept that as a focus that it can be unintentional, intentional. We all have implicit bias and we're gonna get into that here in a few minutes. But implicit bias mean our unconscious bias. And I'm gonna say this once and I am gonna say it again, is that implicit bias or unconscious bias can become conscious bias and yet conscious bias cannot become unconscious bias. It makes a lot of sense and yet that doesn't always um, Uh, present itself to everybody. So I'm going to say that again. Implicit bias can become explicit bias. Unconscious bias can become conscious bias, yet the in reverse that cannot happen. If you know something, it's hard to, un. you can't unknow it in that sense of conscious versus unconscious. So Here is, um, I love this diagram. It's one of my favorites when I am talking about intersectionality. Um, When we talk about privilege um, or uh, society normatives, and we talk about oppression and resistance, if you look at this line of domination, everything below being that of oppression or resistance, everything above being privilege and social norms, I love to take this moment just as a pause to just allow you all to take just a minute or two and just look at this um, chart, this diagram, and see if anything comes up for you. Maybe you knew that to be a privilege or knew that to be oppressed, or maybe this is the first time you're seeing it in this way. And you're like, oh, I never even thought of that as being a privilege. I'm just curious. So in the chat box, if you'd like to contribute to the conversation, feel free to just pop something in there that maybe surprised you when you looked at this, when you, as you look at this um, chart. A few more seconds. So some of the things that when I first looked at this myself, um, one of the first things that came up for me that I didn't think of as being well, I think it's subjective. I don't think it's an objective privilege because I think um, our politics of appearance though, but this is something that I feel is very relevant to how people are really judged and categorized in our society more often than not. Um, because anytime we enter, we are introduced to a new subject or to a new person or something we do not have the neuron pathways for yet, we make a judgment. That's just how we operate as humans. We're going to make a judgment. Is it good? Is it bad? What other points of reference do I have to attribute to this experience or this interaction that I'm having right now? And that's usually when our unconscious bias tends to surface. So within privilege, we have, again, 
our heteronormativity, our, you know, being male, being white, or being of European heritage, um, having financial stability, um, being able-bodied and of good mental health, um, having um, an education, being credentialed, being young, being attractive, being of that upper and upper middle class, if even such thing exists anymore, which I'm not sure if it does, Anglophones. So these are people who just are, we're native English speaking individuals, um, light or pale skinned. And you see this even within, I'll say, I'll speak for just within African American culture or Black culture, there are biases between those of us who are lighter skinned versus who are dark skinned. Um, those who are more light skinned Black individuals, they tend to get more privilege and they, and that's been historical, um, that ability to pass. Those who I identify as trans if they're able to be passed uh, to, to pass or not be clocked um, is is a privilege in our society um, being um, being a Gentile or non-Jew so being a Christian and also the one that was really it is a privilege is to be fertile is the ability to have um, if you are born with a uterus and want to have children that ability is also considered a privilege. to my next little slide here. So here's our matrix of oppression. And here we have our social identity categories. And these, there's more than just this, but what we can kind of notice in this matrix of oppression, which if you can see the, the date stamp on this, it's a little outdated. So transsexual is kind of not so used anymore. So we really do transgender um, or intersex people. So we have our privileged social groups. We have our targeted social groups. And then we're going to have those are kind of in the middle. So we have our, of course, our privileged social groups are going to be those who are white, those who are biological men, those who are gender non-conform or gender conforming, I'm sorry, biological men and women, um, straight or heterosexual uh, people, um, the class being those who have money, again, that financial stability, um, those who are tempor temporarily able-bodied people. And that just made me giggle every time I, I, like, I do this presentation and I see that temporarily able-bodied because there will be a time that all of us will probably need a little support in this world. So if you're able-bodied, Heck yeah. Um, in that, but there will probably be a time where we might need a little bit more assistance. So right now we, I guess we are, it's, it's a gift um, that most of us have this ability to be able-bodied um, for the moment. Um, those who are uh, Protestants, I would say those who identify as Christian or our core type of religion accepted by our society and adults. Adults are a privileged group. Our targeted social groups are going to be children because children are an oppressed group of people. We're seeing that right now, even within gender affirming care legislation, that the whole uproar, a lot of it is about children not having a say so about what happens to their bodies, which again, my studies in gender affirming care and reading the WPATH standards of care, which is the, um, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Um, version eight, it just came out. If you haven't looked at it yet or you're curious, I would very much um, encourage, I don't should on people. That's not a therapeutic thing for me to do. Should it means that there was an expectation and there's not. However, it is an encouragement because there are, there are is empirical research that backs up certain groups of people that in fear or that uncertainty that we look for anything to essentially confirm um, or it's called confirmation bias. So we're gonna lean into those things that we understand or look for like-minded people to make it make sense. Oops, let me go back one, I'm sorry y'all. Um, I was actually just reading the chat, the, the answers that y'all gave me um, for the last slide. Um, so our border social groups, so some, these people might, um, these social groups might uh, kind of go either way. They kind of sit on that fence of privilege and oppression, which are people who are of mixed race. So biracial people, white, Latino, black, Asian, um, transgender people, I would say, uh, 
people who have some who are inter, intersex uh gender at I would say gender queer people that, but also are biological men and women, bisexual people in the LGBT community. They do get a lot of scrutiny. There's a lot of beautiful books out there. If you ever want to know of one, please shoot me an email and I will happily send you some reading material. Um, Middle class people, um, again, people with temporary disabilities. So even a woman who, uh, while, or somebody uh, with a uterus who is um, pregnant, um, who might, end up with um, gestational diabetes. That's a person with a temporary disability so that actually that individual would end up on this border. Um, Roman Catholic, because Catholicism is actually very welcomed religion in our country. Um, And then young adults. So the age range, I would say between like 18 to like, who? Actually, I would say about 16 to about 25, 26, um, or you know, I would say 17 and up really, because 16, 17, you can start making some decisions for yourself in certain areas. So identity is socially and historically constructed, which means that public and individual meanings for these categories and identity will vary. And within our own life experience, how we understand ourselves, please pay attention to this point, How we understand ourselves and how others perceive us varies across time and place with the social location of the observer. I want to stay in this vein for a moment, um, mainly because this um, quote from the article that I found it from really tends to lend itself to even how our students might here at ETSU might experience um, becoming a a minority when they were the majority. So when they come here, how they understand themselves, their worldview might change because they come from a place where they are the majority. That's a privilege for them. It is a huge privilege to grow up with people and areas with individuals that represent and there's visibility and that look like you, that there is a calmness, there is a peace, there is definitely homeostasis that comes with that. Okay, being in that window of tolerance when they get here, whether that's an international student, uh, whether that is a student of color, whether that is a queer student, um, their whole worldview may shift the moment they step on this campus from the moment they find out who their roommate is from the moment that you have they have their first interaction with a professor that moment they walk into the classroom for the first time and they are the only black or person of color in the room and surrounded by a whole bunch of white people in the sense of this is a new experience. So there is no point of reference. The body will go into absolute survival mode. And I believe in my experience, both professionally and personally, being a alum of ETSU, this is not uncommon to have that dysregulation happen when that moment occurs. So what we have is code switching, which is changing up language, even behavior to seem less threatening to the um, majority at large. Um, I have heard of students on campus feeling like they lose senses of themselves, their identity, because they are trying to match energies here on campus with their classmates, with their professor, with their um, GA positions, whatever that might be. So we need to be aware as this new semester is up and coming for those who are here today who also are professors, also do hold space for students in different ways, whether that's mentorship or advisement, that when they come to you, we need to also be very cognizant of these different identities that may and intersections that do and may hold um, senses of oppression um, including, again, that low socioeconomic, um, I like to say, look at it from a biopsychosocial lens. How are How is their biology? Do they have any disabilities that we need to know about? Um, their psyche, like, are you feeling stressed? Are you feeling overwhelmed by this new environment that you're in? You're away from home for the first time. You're having a difficult time adjusting because you might have some social anxiety or you may not have ever had social anxiety until you got here because you found out you were going to be the only 
a person of color in your entire program, um, which has happened with a couple of students that I've seen here um, in therapy. So I know it exists. I know it happens. And so our identities are not fixed or achieved or unitary. Instead, our differences are the kernel from which identities are constantly constructed by the individual and his or her society. So we don't do this ourselves. Um, I, I feel like overall what this is really saying is that um, we are kind of the co-creators of our own um, existence, but the co-creation comes from self, but also comes from external um, uh, external experiences as well. So such as lived experiences, such as our interactions with others, um, legislation, other bigger systems that are on a macro level that also like unfortunately at times are a part of how we co-create ourselves. So let's look at the cycle of oppression. So in our early years, what do children do? Children observe. They are the best observers. I, it never failed when I would see um, couples, because my degree is in marriage, couple, and family counseling. And when I would meet with couples and they're in these disagreements and they're like, we're staying together for the kids. And I would say, you know, your kids are watching you, right? Like they could probably repeat some of the conversations that you haven't probably had to other people. They pick up on your energy. They pick up on your frequency. They pick up on the conversation. They pick up on your behaviors, both subtle, both overt and covert. Yes, this is how we build our responses. Um, and some of these are trauma responses as well. However, if we look at the cycle of oppression in early years is usually when we're going to get that misinformation. We're not going to get the full history or we're going to get bias history. We're going to get stereotyping um, with the removal of critical race theory from K through 12 schools. We're going to start to look at this a little bit differently um, moving forward into the future, because with the removal of certain topics, we're going to certain groups of individuals. And like I said, these young people are going to be missing. There's going to be gaps in how things came to be. We can't talk about one thing without really talking about another. And yet we live in a society that says, yes, we can. And I would continue to combat that and say, no, we cannot. We have to understand where we've been to understand where we are and where we're going. But in those early year, years, we are, that's when we're going to receive a lot of that. So then we're socialized and this cycle is going to be reinforced um, by stereotypes, omissions, distortions, people, systems, and institutions, and people we love and trust, like our family members, um, our schools, our media, and our government, our churches. Um, these cycles are absolutely reinforced. Um, and then this circles into an internalization. So we have been introduced to the, in, to the information. We have been socialized in these different areas through family, neighborhood, education, media and government, houses of worship. And now we're reinforcing these messages for ourselves. So now we become the oppressed and the oppressor. We have inter internalized the process. We view the misinformation as truth. Um, the differences um, are, they're not different anymore. They're just, that's it. And um, the difference is either wrong or abnormal. Within, and I know I keep bringing it back to gender affirming care, and I, I think that's because a big of my, the big passion, like I said, where I got my start really working with a lot of marginalized groups other than the BIPOC community, because I'm very much that, and the queer community, is really that specialty working with trans individuals, because within the LGBTQIA plus community, historically and even to this day, trans individuals do not get the same support as gay, lesbian, ace, um, bisexual, intersex, um, however the people are identifying the trans community tends to be ostracized and be on their own island. Why? Because they're different and we see that as wrong or abnormal or creating more friction than necessary. And again, if we look at the historical constructs of even very, um, uh, I would say the, these righteous movements within the queer community, it was started by trans women of color who got no support, even when they were fighting at the front lines for e equality. So when we collude and be, become both the oppressed and oppressor, what can we do? Well, dissonance is to ask questions. 
The dissonance is to understand each person's intersection, is to show cultural, is to display and employ cultural humility. Again, we're going to get into that into a second, but we have to disrupt cycles. In therapy, a lot of things that we find with our clients is that they're in their own loop, whether that's a trauma cycle, whether that's an abuse cycle, whether that is a negative thought cycle, we're constantly looking of ways to disrupt behavior, to disrupt thoughts, to disrupt these ongoing reinforced messages. So how do we do that? We just insert something different. And that usually does mean getting uncomfortable, which means having to check in with yourself and check in with those levels of privilege and oppression that you might also carry. But understand when you're sitting in front of a person, that exchange, they might see you as a person of power. If you are a professor and a student comes up to you, they know you're in control. They know you're in power. How would that also feel with that transaction of them be feeling like an adult as well. If we could show some humility, some cultural humility, and just recognize that they're a young adult, they sit on that borderline of privilege and oppression. Hmm. We, the world at 18 says you're an adult, but this is a child. This is a person who just graduated high school where everything was done for them. Mostly, not all the time, but mostly. And we, they were sent to college and say, be an adult, live by yourself. Do your own laundry, pay your own bills, study, get good grades, be a, be a good human, um, be a fulfilled human, join these groups like they're trying to be engaged while also trying to figure out who am I as an adult at this time in life. Um, I think it's Erickson, the psychosocial stage of development, we call it um, identity. I think it's still like industry versus inferiority meshed with identity um, versus isolation. So at this time of life, the students that we have are one still in a place of finding themselves and also wanting to figure out like how they can contribute to our society. Otherwise, they're not going to feel good about themselves. They're not going to have that self-esteem. And when you're a person from a marginalized or minoritized group, those feelings of confidence are actually less because you're having to accommodate maybe in other places, like I said, in that code switching or trying to figure out, trying to navigate what it is to be a minority and a majority. Or if you're an international student, these new norms and the slang and vernacular that you're trying to understand and behavior and subtleties and, you know, like again, social norms and all these things that you're trying to absorb as new also while trying to do these other things. So we have to be very aware of these things and intentional. So let's talk about implicit bias. Again, like I said in the beginning, I believe in repetition. I was a teacher at one time or educational assistant. And how do we learn? Repetition. We saw that in the last one, cycles, right? So we're going to do repetition in a different way. So again, Implicit bias can become explicit. Explicit bias cannot become implicit. So implicit bias or implicit social cognition is a descriptive term encompassing thoughts and feelings that occur independently of conscious intention, awareness, or control. You have, you had no idea. I've had people in my life tell me I'm well-spoken for a Black person because in their mind, Black people weren't well-spoken. I have been told I am the whitest Black person that some people know because of the way I dress, the way I carry myself, the way that I speak. I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm not, they feel I wasn't as threatening. It's one, it's a microaggression. And two, it's an implicit bias. They just consider most Black people to not speak well. Well, that's explicit. Black people don't speak well. But for somebody just to say, oh, well, you speak well. Well, hmm, that's interesting. The other thing is like when something comes up. So for the longest time, little self-disclosure, I had a hard time holding space for men in sessions. My implicit bias, and this came from a learned behavior, is that men had more control than me. It's not a lie. However, when I was in the room, I didn't feel like the professional. I would find myself cowering or even making myself small because of lived experiences with the men in my life that I couldn't be the powerhouse that I wanted to be in the room through having some um, supervision with a male supervisor. I was able to work through those implicit bias and find that it's not as 
it wasn't as horrible. So our implicit biases are processes of social perception, impression formation, and judgment over which a person may not always have conscious intentional control. We talk about implicit memory, like the body keeps the score, which if you're a therapist or if you've ever had counseling, you might have heard um, about this book. So the body keeps the score. So once we experience a trauma, whether we remember it or not, our bodies remember. So um, we may smell something and our we might feel sick and we may not understand fully why we feel sick but there's a smell or a sound or a season or a time of year or whatever that might bring up stuff in us these are implicit memories these are, this isn't explicit it's not something that's in the forefront explicit memories like once you learn to ride a bike you always remember how to ride a bike that is you're going to be your explicit memory um so three basic steps in working with implicit bias is that mental recognition or construction of a social group, the association of a stereotype with that group, and the layering of positive or negative association or attitude on top of that stereotype. So with implicit bias, there's a project implicit, it's the IAT test, there's many you can take. If you've never taken an IAT test after today's presentation, I encourage you to go take a few um, based off of maybe things that you might feel you might have implicit bias um, with. Growing up as a minority and a majority for the longest period of time, being around groups of, of all Black people was very difficult for me because I wasn't raised around Black people. Even though I knew I'm a Black person, um, being around Black people, my, inter my interactions were that I wasn't Black enough. So, that, you know, is again, something that I had to work through for myself after going to a training where it was only clinicians of color. I found a lot of healing there because I found out that I wasn't the only person, of course, that feels that way, which is the power of group therapy and power groups in general. But we want to make sure that we're understanding our own implicit biases. So as things that we may not even cognitively be pulling out of our prefrontal cortex, we know for a fact that there's something there that keeps us, that we might, there might be a barrier or maybe apprehensive of, and to do that work to find out why those implicit, implicit bias exists there. <laughs> We're almost done, y'all. So um, this I actually got, um, I do a diversity module here in, uh, for our interns every year, and this was in our training. I don't know if we have a newer updated version of this yet. I got this from my um, their associate um, director of training here um, in our counseling center, Sarah Bedingfield. So we can see that through the over five year period of time that the if we look at race and ethnicity, that the lowest is really our native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. But if we look at um, you know, our black demographic at 6.7, we can look down here and see our white population is 78.8. And, you know, you can see it's kind of fluctuated um, over the years. I'm not sure, again, what it's been over the past three years. I'm hoping we'll have some kind of census like this or data available again, because I do believe it's important that we, as a campus, as a university, continue to stay apprised of our demographics here on campus. And that way we can cater and gear support towards these different intersections that our students are bringing to us. And then employee demographics. And this is over the past, you know, this started 2018, 2019, 2020. Um, and HC, I believe, stands for headcount. So if we look at these numbers again, and this is just employee demographics, we're lacking in diversity here on campus. We're improving on diversity. However, over the years is still a very large deficit between certain groups of people, both student and employee. So I gave this presentation to Quillen College of Medicine and I was deciding whether or not I wanted to take this slide out, but I thought it was very, very important because when I think about health equity, I think about mental health, I think about physical health, I think about spiritual health, I think about the holistic aspect of an individual. And so health equity is a state in which everyone, everyone, everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health. Achieving this requires ongoing societal efforts 
efforts to address historical and contemporary injustices, here it is again. We have to look at the past to see where we are to see how we're going to continue to move forward differently. Overcome economic, social, and, and other obstacles in health and health care and eliminate uh, preventable health disparities. You can interchange this with education. So we can say, um, uh, if you want to look at it to attain their highest level of education, um, we they would we still have to do all these things uh, the uh, and other obstacles in education um, and how we take care of our students within educational systems. And then, of course, to pre eliminate preventable education disparities. So you can, like I said, health equity, educational equity, equity being the thing. So many populations experience mental health disparities, including people from some racial and ethnic minority groups, people with disabilities, women, people who are LGBTQI+, people with limited English proficiency, and other groups, such as our international or immigrant populations as well. So let's look at cult cultural hu uh, humility versus cultural competence. Cultural humility involves entering a relationship with someone with the intention of honoring their beliefs, customs, and values. You remove yourself. My father had a great sermon. My father is a pastor, and he had a he had a sermon years ago, and it was one of my favorites to this day. And he held up this letter B to himself. To him, it was facing. It was it showed a B, and he held it up and he looked at the congregation. He said, "I see a B. What do you see?" And of course, everybody in the congregation was like, a D, right? So he flips it over. He said, I see a P. And what do you see? And they're like, a Q, correct. In cultural humility, I as a B have to go over to the D side and stand and actually look. We cannot stand on our pedestals, tiptoe, look over and make a snap judgment. No, we actually have to take the effort to go over with the intention of honoring their beliefs, customs, and values. We have to humble ourselves. And it does require ongoing processes of self-exploration. You have to do the work. You cannot depend on your students to educate you. If you have a student that you know has historically had um, issues even within their race or sexual orientation, educate yourself. Make sure you know what's going on in society. We'll get into all these here in, a, in that's my next slide. But do the work, sit down, have the conversation. The blending of cultural competence and cultural humility is cultural competimility. It's a, it's a, it's a fun word to say. Um, and this is the synergistic process between cultural humility and cultural competence in which cultural humility permeates each of the five components of cultural competence, being cultural awareness, cultural knowledge, cultural skill, cultural desire, and cultural encounters. So cultural competence is a skill. If you take anything from this slide, Cultural humility is a behavior, it's a practice. Cultural competence is a skill that can be attained. It can be taught, trained, and achieved. What I'm teaching today, this is all cultural competence. Cultural humility would be taking this and going to that person that you've never had a conversation with before, sitting down with them over some tea and saying, tell me about your life experiences. I really want to get to know your worldview and how you see it. Okay, so both though are necessary and sufficient um, and are sufficient conditions for working effectively with diverse populations. So please be cultural competent and also display cultural humility whenever the opportunity presents itself. So this quote is one of my favorites. Sit with it, sit with it, sit with it. Even though you want to run, even when it's heavy and difficult, even though you're not quite sure the way through, healing happens by feeling. And this is a quote from Rebecca Way. And I really, I really, um, that really resonates me in the sense of the healing happens by feeling. As a therapist, <laughs> we, we are definitely one that want our clients to really feel what's happening, but also that feeling also does lead to the healing. And that healing process is not always comfortable. It's not meant to be. So how can I practice cultural competence and cultural humility? Consider whether politics or laws such as immigration laws or recent federal government, um, like for this example, move to eliminate protections for transgender Americans are adding to the stress of diverse communities. If you, 
as a person in power are also a person of color, consider how that affects your practice and work with diverse individuals. So know your own, we, again, we all have to know our own um, biases, how that works. If you are European American, Caucasian, white, however you wanna describe it, reflect on the implicit biases that may affect your practice with diverse individuals and theirs with you. Pay attention to office practices in your offices, in your schools of, you know, college and arts and sciences, in your own personal offices. Um, what do you have an atmosphere of, of welcoming everyone? Does it come across as inclusive? Um, what accommodations might be necessary? Reassure by words and actions that you are interested. That's active listening skills. Lock it in. Show them that you are engaged. Show them that you want to know. Um, are you sure by words and actually you're interested in understanding and helping to co-construct a plan to fit the needs? State up front that this is a collaborative process. This isn't just me making this decision. This is us. And that you welcome input in the process, communicating openly with each other and the product, which is the outcome. Ask directly if there are experiences of discrimination, bullying, traumas, or harassment, and or are there fears associated with the minority status or any intersection or identity that carries a weight of oppression. And then identify strengths, interests, and resilience factors with this individual. You don't have to pander. You don't have to um, oversimplify. You can just agree. Yeah, you've been through it, and I don't know what that's like. I have a therapist who is who is not my same race. And when everything went down with George Floyd, the you know, we were talking and she said, I know I looked at her and I said, you have no idea what I'm thinking and no idea what I'm going through. And she didn't even try to counteract that. She said, you're absolutely right. So that was cultural humility that she practiced in that moment. So lastly, this is a quote. Angela Davis is a particular hero of mine. Um, I just love her work. I love her fight. I love her advocacy um, that she continues to do this day. But this quote of, I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things I cannot accept. We have to be um, our own conduits of change. And that on a macro level may look daunting, but if we can make micro subtleties, if we can change and be intentional, we can make big changes, understanding intersectionality, understanding that we are not one thing and that any person who we are interacting on a day-to-day -day basis might carry some level of oppression. So we want to be very sensitive, culturally sensitive, um, and just, again, continue to do the work. Um, if you have any questions, so we have a beautiful Office of Equity and Inclusivity. I'm here in the Counseling Center. Schedule a conversation. I don't care to have these conversations. I think they're necessary um, in our ongoing process to create a safe place here at ETSU and in our community for all minoritized, marginalized, and diverse populations that might be. I appreciate, again, your attention today. Thank you again for joining me. Here is my information. Um, if you'd like to reach out to me, again, I'm here in the Counseling Center. Um, and uh, again, I appreciate it. it's been an honor to share this information with you um, today. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And I think we have a few minutes left um, for any kind of uh, questions that might came up or reflection, I am open to that. I know we only have about five minutes left, um, but if you have anything to offer, I am, I'm here. Thank you all so much. I hope you have a beautiful, beautiful day. Thank you all so much for your kind words. And um, I appreciate that very, very much. This is about a week of speaking engagements for me. So I have two more, um, but thank you all for your kindness. Thank you for being here. I believe um, Chastity said that there was a recording of this. If you uh, would like to see this, it'll be on, I believe the YouTube um, website uh, or YouTube channel uh, for equity and inclusivity. So um, I hope you all have a beautiful rest of your day and um, thank you.
Thank you again.